Hi guys, it's Heather Darnall. Welcome back to my art channel. Thank you for joining me for another video. And please excuse any noise that the mic picks up. My son is in his room across the way there entertaining himself with his cars and trains. So anyways, at least he's having a good time. Um, anyway, so a friend of mine of 30 years, she is my sister in Christ. I can't believe I'm saying that number to 30. My gosh, you guys, that's a long time. But anyway, she just got married and I asked her what she would like for her wedding gift. And because you never know what some people want, you know, some people want something small. Other people would like something, some money to contribute to something big that they need. But in this case, she said, no, 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 I don't want any of that kind of stuff. What I would like from you is a painting. And she wants a lavender painting because her wedding was themed around lavenders. And so I said, absolutely being super happy that she asked me to paint something for her and so glad knowing that she enjoys my artwork. So we're just gonna do a really cute vintage picture of lavender and try to keep the palette pretty neutral because you know I think that lavender pairs and marries really well with um, neutral colors. And I'm gonna see if I can throw a little bit of detail in there as far as like having a little bit of gold just to make it pop, but I'm not sure yet, we'll see how it goes. But before we get started, today's ministry snack comes from the book of Jeremiah, chapter seven, verses 25 and 26, and it reads, since the day that your fathers came out of the land of Egypt until this day, I have sent you all my servants, the prophets, daily, rising early and sending them. Yet they did not listen to me or incline their ear, but stiffened their neck. They did more evil than their fathers. Okay, so there's a lot of people who, who don't know who Jeremiah is or don't even know what a prophet is, and it's okay. Uh, a lot of us are different points in our learning journey and our walk with Jesus, so don't know no judgment here. It took a while before I even know who Jeremiah was too. But anyways, he was a prophet and a prophet was somebody that was set aside or appointed by God to speak on his behalf in the Old, in the Old Testament. So before Jesus came around, these people were the ones that you would um, speak to if you wanted to speak to God. And if God wanted to speak to his people, he would speak to them through the, these prophets. But anyways, Jeremiah was uh, a very interesting prophet. He was actually known as the weeping prophet and not because he was like this whiny guy. It's just that he unfortunately had a ministry that was not very successful. And it sounds very odd that why God would set a prophet up to be unsuccessful. But God forewarned him in the beginning when he set him aside. He said, hey, listen, I've got all these things I need you to say and do on my behalf, but nobody's going to listen to you. So don't be surprised. Because I already knew this was going to happen anyways, but I'm just letting you know um, it's going to get pretty bad. And I don't need you to um, uh, get in the way of what they're doing. All you need to do is just send them these messages and say the things I'm telling you to say. Now, when we think about, um, you know, trying to share the word with other people, even in current times, I know it's very intimidating and we get worried like, oh, what if they don't? believe in God, what if I said doesn't isn't enough for them to say, or I don't think I sound very good or eloquent in speech, and I certainly don't think I am very eloquent in speech. I'm just grateful anything that you pick up is, you know, that, that's enough for me. If you pick up one tidbit of this message, then I think that's a success. But anyways, it's not my responsibility. It, your heart has to be open to receiving the message, and the people that Jeremiah was prophesying to, their heart was just not open. So don't feel like um, if you're speaking to somebody and their heart is not open that you're somehow responsible for converting them or doing something like that. That is God's responsibility and he will reward you anyway. So it's not a number, it's not a quota. It's not a number of people who he's expecting for each of us to um, believe in Jesus. That is really up to him, that he is the, he is the um, one who will grow that person from the seed that we plant based on the word that we give. So God sent Jeremiah out all over the place to um, warn and prophesy to these people that because their behavior was so inappropriate that he's about to basically level the place. And what makes God so good, or one of the things that makes God so good is that no matter how many times um, and how long these people have turned their backs on him, he still wanted everybody to have adequate warning. He wanted to get everybody another chance, regardless of how evil and wicked they've been. Um, but he was hoping that Jeremiah would really just be, um, you know, winner, winner, chicken dinner and be the one that would change these people's hearts. But God already knew. And unfortunately, like I said, he used Jeremiah to share the word anyways and give these warnings, but nobody really, nobody really cared. And if they had cared, they would have avoided literal, complete catastrophe. But instead, they continued to, um, uh, embrace their evil and wicked ways. So real quick here, let's just talk about the words evil and wickedness and what you think they are, because I'll tell you what they are. 
what they are are two words that today's society has literally watered down to a point to only mean something completely heinous. And while that is obvious, um, God says differently. He says, if it is not a reflection of me, it is not parallel with my word or my ways, it is indeed evil or wicked. And we just tend to brush all that stuff under the rug and pretend that what we do that is um, on the lighter side of, you know, shortchanging someone by five cents or saying the littlest white lie, although they don't may not seem like they cause significant damage, it still goes against the way of God. Therefore, we become numb to that stuff and more daring to the bigger stuff and then become numb to that and then we just seriously get heinous. We really get ugly. And so I'm not saying everybody is a heinous person, but when we don't have, we don't welcome the Holy Spirit in our heart, we are just simply wicked and evil, and evil people. And God wants to change his people. He wants to change our hearts. So at this point, with all this wickedness and evil going on for just generations and generations, he has added up to here and he's about to level the place. It's going to be desolated because people are just not taking heed to his word. Um, he literally... I mean, Israel was a blessed nation. They were handpicked by God so that any outsiders looking in can look at that nation and be like, man, I want what they have. You know, they've got a God that takes care of them. They're provided for, they're cared for. What do I have to do to get in on this? You know, and so you would think that they would just still be, you know, living in such a goodness, but they didn't. And all because they simply to follow basic rules. That was God's terms. Like, hey, you can have all this and you will forever have all this, you know, but in heaven and on earth, but you, you have to follow these, these rules. Think about it. When we grew up, we had parents that were like, hey, take the trash out, make your bed, don't act a fool, you know, do your homework. And looking back at it, talk about really simple things. I mean, I look back at it, I'm like, man, I can't believe I gave my parents any kind of trouble. Like, oh, I'm gonna do this. I mean, really, and I bet you if you're a parent now, you expect the same thing from your kids. Like, hey, you know, bring your dirty dishes to the sink, put your clothes away, make your bed, you know, get to get to bed on time, that kind of stuff. And they're really basic, simple rules. But the bottom line is, is you're showing respect. You're showing that you're um, serving your parents and not in a way like you're like a slave or something. You're, you're just, you're serving. You're, these, the point of our chores that we are assigned are to be helpful. They are to show that we are willing to submit to our parents and do whatever it is that will make them happy. And God is just basically saying the same thing. I just want you to submit. I just want you to follow my ways and show me you love me. And when you can do that wholeheartedly, you will not believe how I can shower you with blessings. And they just simply continue to refuse any kind of warning or message. And um, they got dealt with just like we did when we were kids and just like our kids do when we got to deal with them. So God is now using Jeremiah at this point in his ministry warning them that, hey, since I freed your fathers, aka former generations, out of the hand of Egypt, out of harsh bondage and slavery, uh, so somehow they had seemed to dismiss all of God's miracles that he had done from the time that he walked them through the Red Sea to this point in time when they were just all running, running amok, you know what I mean? And just being wicked and evil. And they really, again, just couldn't um, grasp on the fact that what God had done for them was demonstrate an indescribable level of compassion and way that he was willing to fight for them, but they just really didn't care. They didn't care that God brought them out of a despicable situation and put them into a wonderful situation, a situation where they had never ending, you know, hookups and freedom. But that freedom is meant to be spared from anything that makes our heart icky and spared for the freedom to worship God and continuously growing an everlasting, wonderful relationship with him. Um, so straight out of Exodus, Moses is up, you know, talking with God on a mountain where um, there is where God literally writes the Ten Commandments for him to take back down the mountain and share with his people. And those first two commandments, believe it or not, are very similar, which should give you an idea how adamant God is about these commandments. The first one is, Thou shall have no other gods besides me. And the second one is, Thou shall not have or make any graven images. Even if you think it's a resemblance of God and it gives you hope, he says, don't do anything. Don't carve anything. Don't make anything. 
You just need to seek my presence and that is sufficient. Don't go and do something dumb because once you, you know, start going down that avenue, real bad things are going to happen. And that's specifically called idolatry. And he absolutely thinks that's an abomination. And while Moses was receiving these commandments, the people of Israel that were down, down the mountain couldn't even wait 10 minutes, so to speak, before they lost patience since Moses was gone and they really didn't know what to do. So they decided, well, I guess we don't have a leader anymore. Let's just make another one. How about we use all this gold that we took out of Egypt with us and we'll assemble and fashion ourselves this golden calf. And somehow everybody thought that was a good idea. I mean, really, what a dumb thing to do. Just being so fresh out of bondage that they put themselves into another type of bondage a bondage that keeps them from understanding the true living God and how he works for them and the things he has in store for them and so here they are clearly showing dismissal um, of God and their impatience that they just couldn't wait a little bit to see what Moses was going to bring down and share with them but instead they wanted to fashion this golden calf and literally bow down to it worship it and worse worse off they believed in it like they literally believed it could do the things that god was doing for them so yeah you can see that they literally put this golden calf before god they put it in the place of the living god and you know what it literally that is where the term stiff neck comes from is because the people of israel have become stiff necked just like the same way they had fashioned their fake god um, it is ill capable of doing virtually anything. It cannot lean its ear down. It cannot hear your prayer. It cannot extend its arm out to protect you. It cannot lead, guide, or direct you. It is a, a little empty, useless vessel made of materials that are of such high value that could have paid for so many things that were supposed to be a blessing in their life, but instead they wasted on this stupid golden calf and God always he he noticed this was happening he knew it was going to happen anyways he's all knowing um and it's it's not so this was no surprise for him it was a total call it moment <laughs> but anyways he still had the mercy to set aside these prophets and to rise them up daily and to send them out and give everybody the message they needed to hear the warnings they needed to hear um, so that they could be spared from this desolation. Now, this would only prove to them that their assembled fake gods that they have come up with can't do a darn thing to save them from all this stuff that's going to happen, um, which you would think um, you they would take a quick second and reflect back on all the things that God did and really go, wait a minute, can this thing do the same thing that God did? I mean, I created it. I created it just to sit here and look at but sadly, they just grew more evil than their fathers did. Now, we need to take heed to this message and understand that we too, in today's society, current times, we have also become very stiff-necked like the um, counterfeit gods that these people have um, come up with and displayed over the centuries. Uh, we have really just dismissed our true living God and um, welcomed in a counterfeit fake God instead. Now, what do I mean by worshiping other gods? You know, some people unfortunately think that um, even dear people that we hold near or dear to our heart that are in the Bible, like the saints, for instance, or the Virgin Mary, think that they are worthy of worship. And although they are beautiful souls and did help um, in advancing God's kingdom, God, Jesus said so himself, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. And nowhere in scripture does it say that we are to worship anybody else. Nobody else, no matter how awesome they were in the Bible, is worthy of worship because they too are just human. They are created by the Creator. Jesus is uncreated and so therefore the only one to be worshipped because he is capable of anything and is the only one that can love us as much as he does. These examples are um, our phones. You guys, today's society is becoming overly consumed myself included. I really have to be better about putting my electronics down. Um, but we are basically bowing down to technology and social media these days. And think about it. Here's a, here's a good example just to prove my point. When our phones update, what's the first thing we do? We might get a little upset like, oh, it changes again. Ugh. 
But no matter what, we are the first thing we, we are willing to do is to learn those new changes. We are willing to do whatever it takes to maintain our relationship with our phone, with our electronic devices, with social media, and what everybody else thinks about us and our two cents in their life and vice versa and all that kind of stuff. We are bowing down to these things that were supposed to be a blessing, not a curse. And they have become a curse because we have replaced God with things. And if it's not a thing, it's a hobby or it's a lifestyle. And while hobbies and lifestyles are good, they are supposed to glorify God. He put dreams in our hearts so that they would be put to good use to glorify him and advance his kingdom. Not to be greedy and totally prideful like, oh, look how awesome I could be because you're not that awesome. God is awesome. And until you can admit that, then he will literally exalt you and be like, you know what, look at my servant over here doing an awesome job submitting to me. Look at this. Look what I'm going to do for them. And so when we, when we can get our stuff together and realize, you know, just where we are in our life, worshiping things instead of God, we, until then, we won't realize how much worse off we're going to be if we don't shape up because we will definitely ship out. And this nation, like Israel and other nations, have been under judgment. Now, God saves his judgment until end times because that's why Jesus came. He came to save the world, not to judge it. But that doesn't mean that God is not growing angry in the meantime. So let this message of not taking action to your um, ways of life, to not taking heed to being stiff-necked, you're going to experience a life that you are never meant to experience. You are meant to be a part of God's cherished kingdom and his be a part of his children. So again, really just think about what's most important to you and what in your life can give you the most benefits and love. It certainly can't be an object. It can only be the one true living God. Let him prove that to you. All right, guys, thanks for letting me be so long-winded, but let's get started. I'm beginning my project by applying some painter's tape to my pre-sketched project along the inside of the picture and across the top of the table or whatever kind of base you want to call it. I'm doing that so when I paint in the background color, I'm not worried about going over any lines and don't have to spend any extra time in paint trying to cover and correct anything. Now I'm filling in the background with my one inch tip flap brush using about a 50-50 mix of the colors unbleached titanium and titanium white, just applying one coat going back and forth. Once that's completed, I take a big porous sponge and lightly dab it into titanium white and then gently apply it over this portion of the background to sort of help give it a more textured appearance without being too busy or taking away from anything. Here's the removal of the tape, which you can see it does help minimize more work I would have to do to ensure straight lines and helps avoid any paint that spilled over the tape. Once you can see there's paint that went past my tape lines and over the handle, but it's not much and it is a light color so I won't need to use but one coat. I'm highly doubting too. Now I'm going to use more painter's tape to put on top of the baseline so that when I paint the base, it hopefully doesn't go into the background that I just finished as well as the bottom of the picture. For the base, I'm still using my 1 inch tip flap brush with about a 50-50 mix of titanium white and neutral gray number 5 this time. Notice I'm still doing back and forth brush strokes, but I'm also using the chisel edge 2 and incorporating just straight up neutral gray number 5 so it sort of looks like a slab table, like a slab stone or something, um, instead of just a plain old gray section that has no detail.
Now for the shadowing of the picture, I'm still using the same brush and add some Payne's Gray. I make the shadow at about a 45 degree angle or so and then use my number six flat shader brush with my 50-50 mix along the sides to help it blend nicely. But don't forget only wet and wet paint works best for blending. Using my same flat shader brush, I'm just going to come in here and clean up some of that unbleached titanium mix. Although for the handle, I have to switch to my number two filbert brush so I can get into those tighter areas. And here's more painter's tape now applied on the exterior portion of the picture because obviously I don't want any color spilling over into the background or onto the base. You'll see I use a lot of titanium white and then I'm also doing back and forth brush strokes. Although in this case, I'm actually contouring the bottom line of the picture so it helps give it a rounded look. Take note, I also contour the top portion of the picture to keep the shape of that section as well. Next, you'll see I add in some neutral gray number five along the left side of the picture on the bottom portion or lower half that doesn't go very far into it, but maybe a half an inch or so. And then I also apply it going in the same direction that I did the titanium white. It may look and even feel thick or blotchy for you if you do it, but remember we want a vintage look to it. So imperfections are a good thing in this case. Notice here I'm using more titanium white. However, I'm using it on the right side to blend in the neutral gray number five. Keep in mind that although it appears I'm doing back and forth brush strokes still, I'm really applying the paint in one direction to prevent the gray from coming over too far. So I'm painting the titanium white going from left to right. For the shadowing on the right side of the picture, I'm doing the same thing, just applying several layers of titanium white and neutral gray number five, only I'm aiming to keep the right side of the picture a little darker. When I'm done, I add titanium white along the center to help blending and to keep the picture bright without losing all my shadowing details. Now I'm using the chisel edge of my brush using neutral gray number five and softly draw in, so to speak, the rim along the mid portion of my picture. You'll notice I run the paintbrush through the rim right quick, but it's because I still want that section to look aged as well. For the rusted out portions, I switched to my 316 inch deer foot brush using the color raw umber and gently dab it in. Take note the entire bottom rim is covered in it while the top portion and midsection is minimal, although you can make it as rusted out as you want.
Here I switched to my number zero round brush using titanium white again to basically re-wet the paint so I can blend more raw umber or more rusted details onto the handle. Once I'm done outlining portions of the handle, I move on to the bottom of the picture followed by the top. Take note that with the top portion of the picture, I just make a consistent line on the bottom edge of the rim and then a few small sections on the top, kind of like how I outlined the sections of the handle. Still using the same brush, I'm now adding a rich iridescent precious gold for some added detail and reflection along the middle rim, but I'm not completely filling it in. I want some of it to look rubbed off. Here I'm just going back to my grace to clean up the small amount of white that went over my tape. Back to my number zero round brush, I'm now going to paint in the lavender using two shades of green. The first one is a chrome green oxide and the other is a green gray. I do about a 50-50 mix of the colored stems, but you can make that ratio your own. Take note the stems are at different heights and overlap as well for a more natural look. If you find yourself struggling like I do from time to time to keep your paint extending on such a thin little brush, might I suggest using a floating medium, which is what I'm using here, that keeps your paint going and looking smoothly with sharp edges. Anyway, you'll see that I leave about a couple of inches of background at the top, but again, if you want to make your own tweaks, please do so. Make every little detail on this painting to your liking. That's what's important, is that you actually like what you made. Now for the lavender, I'm going to use two shades of purple, starting with the darker purple first, which is a prism violet. All I'm doing is just making little marks or like tiny little hash marks at about a 45 degree angle and then going down about a half an inch or so. Leave a little gap and then do another small set or two of flowers. Don't worry if some of the purple blends in from overlapping flowers. That's normal and to me looks more realistic.
Once I've painted in flowers for each of my stems, I go back over the darker purple with a lighter shade called Pale Violet. What I'm doing is just adding in a few marks on each stem so that the lavender will have a two-toned look. Okay, oh my gosh, you guys, that picture is super vintagey looking, really pretty, and that little strip of gold, like just so minimal, but it really enhances the whole thing. I just find it fascinating how like a little tidbit of detailing can really just make a picture or a piece in the painting just pop. It's it's crazy. I love it. <laughs> Okay guys, if you liked this demo, please be sure to not only share, but to also hit like and subscribe for more videos. Of course, you guys know that liking and sharing helps other people find this video too, but more importantly, remember to thank God for this opportunity and always paint from the soul. See you later. Bye.